Oh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Robert M. Gower from Institut Polytechnique Telecom Paris uh, as our latest guest lecturer in our seminar series here at Montreal MLOPT. Um, he has done a lot of work in optimization, in particular stochastic, a lot of work in stochastic problems, as far as I, as I know. And today he is going to talk to us about a very recent, actually ongoing piece of work okay on uh, stochastic polyac step sizes uh, very exciting because it's uh, it's very fresh so uh, yeah. uh, rob welcome and the floor Thank is you. yours okay thanks for the invite I'm very happy to be here this is um i'm going to talk about something yeah like i said a part of it is ongoing work and because of this i change the title every time i think about what this is what it means um i'm okay with people asking questions halfway and um I'm happy to clarify things. So I have the I have the one title, which is new viewpoints and variants of, of stochastic poly accept sizes. You'll see that this title is sort of half true because it's going to get going to introduce some quite strange variants of what are related to poly accept sizes, but not really. There's also I also have an honest title in blue, which is I use Newton Rapson to design new stochastic methods. Okay, and you'll see how that works. So I'm basically going to show you that everything is newton rapson and as soon as you realize that, your work is done. You, you have convergence theories, you know everything about it. <laughs> okay, so what's the problem? No surprise here, I want to minimize a sum of an average of functions fi. You can call this, you know, the training problem, empirical risk minimization. I, I often just call it a sum of terms, sum of things. So I'm not going to think about actually minimizing an ex a true expectation. I'm going to work with a discrete sum. And uh, I have this sort of wish list of a method that I wish existed. So I wish there was a method that was incremental. So you only had to see, let's say, one of these FIs. So each one of these FIs, I should say, is a sort of loss function over the IF piece or batch of data you've been given. So I wish I had a method that would only use one single loss function at each iteration that was invariant to arbitrary aspects. So I'm gonna explain what that means. But I want this method to only depend on, on important things of the problem and ignore everything that doesn't matter. So I'll, I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean by that. And ultimately, I wanted to have few parameters and easy to tune, okay? So this is a wish list, and I, I've been thinking a lot about methods that achieve these, in particular, these last two things. I'm not gonna achieve these things in my talk. It's not really, I'm not gonna like solve all this. I'm just gonna talk about, no, I wish I could do this and I'm gonna try to work towards it and get somewhere. So let me talk about method that doesn't achieve some of this, but not everything. So let's take a stochastic gradient descent. I guess by the looks of things, everyone is basically an optimizer. So I'm gonna like just gloss over basic optimization. Um, so here it is. We're gonna sample a single I uh, data point or a batch IID uniformly and update in the negative direction of stochastic gradient. There's going to be some sort of step size, the learning rate, and oh, here's the bad point. The learning rate depends on arbitrary aspects of our problem. So it depends on what I'm going to call the scale of your function. And any kind of parameterization, any sort of arbitrary representation of this function, the learning rate depends on it. It needs to know all the arbitrary aspects. So I'm going to give you a really silly example by what I mean. Um, just because I like silly and simple. So let's let's consider this very silly thing. Uh, let's imagine you again want to solve the sum of terms problem, but now I'm going to make a change. I'm going to multiply my entire objective function by a constant c, positive number c. Yeah, you can quite easily see that these two problems are still the same. It doesn't change the solution. It doesn't, so you still have the same w star I'm using to denote one of the minimas. This one is a beautiful quadratic, so it has a unique minima. And then I multiply by constant C, I stretched the level sets, but the solution doesn't change. But SGD changes. It needed to know that you changed the representation because on the left, I have SGD applied to the top problem. On the right, I have SGD applied to the one on the right. And suddenly there's this constant C, uh-oh. So the learning rate needed to be aware that you just randomly rescaled your function. It's really unfortunate because the problem itself doesn't depend on this but the method does. So this is an example, a very silly, ex obvious example of what I would call an arbitrary dependency. On the opposite end of the scale, 
being optimized, you, you might be aware that second order methods actually ha uh, handle many invariances beautifully. So if I were to consider these two problems, on the left is the same problem we started with, and on the right, I'm gonna muddle it up. Okay, I'm gonna, how am I gonna muddle it up? First, I'm gonna apply an affine map to the coordinates, to the, to the parameters themselves. So now I'm gonna parameterize it by vector y. I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna multiply it by an invertible map and add on a constant vector b. I'm also gonna multiply that same constant c because you know, why not? Now, if you think about the solution to this change problem, let's call it y star, it's quite easy to see that you can recover the original problem w star by just doing this operation here on, on y star, it's, it's obvious. And the cool thing about Newton type methods or second order methods, if I apply, I'm gonna apply, I'm gonna make up a kind of second order method. I'm gonna apply sort of a stochastic Newton method where I sample a single data point and take a, a Newton step on that loss function. What happens if I apply a Newton step on the one on the top right? Uh, what I get is a method that looks a bit different because there's this, there's this A matrix here in the front, but it's quite easy to see that it's equivalent because there's a mapping that takes you from the coordinates of one, yt, so wt and, and back and forth, it's an invertible map. So uh, th this is a cool aspect of our second order methods and it's because of these uh, invariances that make them quite general in a sense that you don't need to retune them to work for large classes of functions. And I think this is what led to sort of the revolution in the, in the late 80s that you know, we, we sort of came up with methods for solving general convex problems, more or less general, there are some caveats. You know, finding a polynomial time algorithm with a sort of interior point style methods. Fun fact I always like to share, I don't know why. Uh, in the late 80s, it came out in the New York Times actually, that uh, second order methods solved convex optimization. And if you read, if you have absolutely incredible superhuman vision and you can read a tiny little square down here, it says a, a Soviet discovery rocks the world of mathematics. And it says that the Soviet mathematician had solved the traveling salesman problem. Uh, and explain what the traveling salesman problem is. It's completely wrong. It's not the traveling salesman problem at all. It's missing integer variables. But the point remains that, you know, because of these beautiful invariances, you sort of get almost like general like methods for solving convex. Oh, but there are some issues with this, of course. Uh, the first issue with the method I just showed you here, it doesn't make any sense for non-convex at all. This doesn't really mean that it's going anywhere for non-convex. It's also expensive. I've got a matrix inversion, so, you know, there are many issues, but I still find this inspiring and you're gonna see sort of how I'm inspired by this. I'm inspired by this because I'm gonna use a Newton style technique to create new methods. And it's, I'm, it's gonna call, I'm gonna call it later on, the subsample newton rapson method. I'll explain exactly what that means. Uh, so don't, don't sweat it just yet. So what I'm gonna do for my entire talk, I'm gonna do this again and again, and again, and, and that's about it. I'm gonna first get our problem of interest, you know, minimize the sum of terms. I'm gonna rewrite it in different ways as nonlinear equations. I'm gonna do lots of different tricks and change its representation. And then I'm gonna apply a subsample to Rapson, and I'm gonna come up with really cool uh, incremental methods that have some nice invariances and have really nice convergence properties. That's my entire talk. The only thing that's missing is the details, there are many details. Okay, so the first example, and I don't suspect everyone would have thought this, is in fact SGD with polyx step sizes. This is the first example of, of a newton rapson method. And I know there are lots of, of polyac experts here, so I have questions for you guys as well. There's not gonna be just questions for me. So let's say you wanna solve, you wanna minimize the finite sum of, uh, the sum of terms problem, and for now, we're gonna assume that we know what is exactly fi evaluated on, on one of the minimas w star. It can be any one actually, but let's just let's assume we know one of them. So this is a, this is a tough thing to know. Uh, the only example really where you would know this is if you have a model that interpolates the data or is over-parameterized, if you, if you guys know what I mean. I think most of you, many of you do. So this, so if we know what is in fact the optimal, the value of these fi functions on the optimal, on the minimum, 
why don't we just try to solve the nonlinear equations f i w equals f i star? We should just like attack this problem head on and really abuse the knowledge we have because you know for some reason we know this. Let's really attack these nonlinear equations. So notice there are n of them, right? There are multiple equations, so it's a system of nonlinear equations. To solve this, I need a method that can solve nonlinear equations, but also does it in a sort of subsampled way. Cool. So a uh, subsampled way, because I can't, I need to you know, pick up just one row of this nonlinear equation and do something just with one row. I have a question. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, right. So here, uh, just to clarify, the, the assumption is that there exists a universal W star, right? That um, basically minimizes all of those component functions. Uh, actually, I'm not assuming it minimizes the component functions. I'm assuming that there exists a minima of the average and okay. that we know what is fi evaluated in W star. So we can just evaluate them. OK, OK. Yeah. And then there's a comment by, uh, I guess it's it's a comment, not a question, Nicolas, right? Yeah, uh, we can, there is not, you don't need just interpolation, you're saying. There are other situations. Yeah. That's true, yes, yes. So I comment that fi star, it's, if, the, if this is defined to be the infimum of the functions of i, then this is always zero for most of the machine learning mm -hmm. applications without assuming interpolation, like yeah. logistic regression, least squares, exponential loss, all of these losses have infimum of the fi's to be zero. Uh, so it's not necessarily a known quantity. But Nicholas, what, uh, ro yes? I don't think that's what you meant. You see, W star is not, uh, as Yadis said, W star is not the infimum of each different function. W star is the minimum of the average. So you're, you're asking the value of all of the individual functions at the minimum of the average. And this is not zero unless you have interpolation. Well, I mean, uh, actually, I, I, it's at least not known. At least I wouldn't, I can't, I couldn't think of clear situations when this would be known, uh, excluding interpolation. And I think I can also work in the regime where they are the minimums of the individual functions, but then you need some other assumption. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rob. Go ahead, please. So, okay. so I guess just, just to oh. clarify, so basically, fi star here could be um, uh, much bigger than the minimum of fi over w, which is what uh, Nicolas Loiseau was using in his algorithm. So it's kind of a different uh, pull. Yes. Set size. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. OK. OK. All right. Unless we assume interpolation, then they're all the same, depending what kind of interpolation you're talking about. OK. So uh, OK. So let's try and attack these nonlinear equations head on. We, we know that if we solve these equations, we will at least find a w star because if it matches the loss, the 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 value of the loss function, f i, at w star, then clearly it's at least another minima, if not the same w star we saw before. It's another one. It must be. So I'm I, I'm going to come up now with a subsampling method for solving nonlinear equations, and the method works like this. It's actually newton raphson very simply subsampled newton raphson And what does that mean? So newton raphson works like this. Uh, well, first, I'm going to do subsampling. So I'm going to sample a single index i. So I'm just sampling one. Let's just say uniformly, uniformly at average. And I'm going to stare at f i w. And I'm going to realize it's a nonlinear function. I don't know how to find zeros in nonlinear functions. So I'm going to linearize it. I'm going to take its local linearization around my, let's say, my previous best guess of what the solution is, so a w t. So it's, it's an iterative algorithm. I'm at a current iterate wt. I'm going to linearize my function around wt. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, well, I, I'm going to actually linearize this entire equation, the, the equation up here, fi w equals fi star. The linearization is here of that equation. And I'm just going to solve the linearization. But there's an issue. Uh, this linear equation now has one equation and has d unknowns. So there are infinite solutions. So which solution do I pick? I pick the solution that was closest to my previous iterate WT. I'm going to project my previous iterate WT onto the solution space of these linear equations. Can anyone guess what method this is? It's this. It's, uh, it's SGD with polyaxial sizes. 
if you solve the projection, it's just um, very simply SPS. And uh, I think I have down here the reference. Yeah, I'll, I'll just leave the reference. SPS, as named at least in Nicola, Sharon, Isam, and Simon's paper, which actually got me very motivated about this method in the first place. So this method, uh, I, it got me motivated because it has some really cool invariances. You may notice right away that if you just rescale the loss functions, nothing changes in the algorithm. It, what changes is W star and Fi star, but aside from that, it's completely invariant. The first reference I can find of this is, is Polyak 1983. The first time he wrote in English, though, is, is different than the first time he wrote about it in Russian. And I'm quite confused sometimes. Uh, and one question I had for the, the SPS people, I've tried to read Polyak's things to figure out what was his first motivation. What was the first thing you know? he said, uh, oh, I, I motivate this step size like this. And he motivated it for linear functions. Uh, not with it the same way, but he it was for linear functions, at least in his, in the English, in his English textbooks and earlier on. Nicola, question? Uh, yeah, I mean, you call this SPS, but uh, it comes back to exactly the discussion we we're having on a previous slide, right? This is not exactly SPS because you don't use the same because FI star. Because of FI star, yes. Just to be clear. Yeah, yeah actually, so I hadn't, it hadn't even dawned on me the subtle difference. I'm actually going to think a little bit about that. But yes, because of the um, FI star, I guess we're not talking about exactly the same thing. So, Rob, this ratio can now be negative. E yes, in that sense, it could be negative. You're right. If this is not the minimum, it's possible that it become negative. Yeah. Yes. So it's not really it's not really a polyx step size in the sense that there is no function suboptimality in the numerator, and that's the the basic definition of it. Correct. Having the difference right, of right. the function the, the function difference and then the and the ratio with the norm of the gradient. That's right, why yes. I defined it with respect to Polyak. This is something slightly different, which I'm yes. not sure exactly how it's connected. Right. Okay. So I'm, I hadn't actually hadn't actually dawned on this subtle difference. I'm a bit I'm a bit suspicious now. But you're right. I guess in the way I've set it up, and and the proof is so straightforward. I think I can even convince you very soon that this just converges very simply. So it's a very very close cousin. Foliac. Okay. So now I'm just going to, you know, I like illustrations and I can rarely ever do illustrations. So I'm going to, you know, do some more illustrations. So uh, what this means is, you know, uh, when we linearize and take the linearized version of the equation, we have a hyperplane, which I've done in pink. It's um, here. And the entire method works like this you get your previous iterate WT and you project onto that hyperplane. And that gives you your know, iterate WT plus one just to have a nice drawing uh, from the function from the function value point of view it looks more like this though imagine that fi is a beautiful quadratic because it's the only functions i can ever imagine just some beautiful quadratics and uh of course now because i put w star at the bottom of fi i must be assuming interpolation or assuming the the kind of polyac that you guys are talking about um so let's just temporarily assume that for one slide uh, so what the method says is, you know, at your current point, which is up here on A, you linearize, you follow the linearization until you hit, uh, and this is interpolation, so until you hit zero. Yes, this is exactly for interpolation. I've done this drawing. So until you hit zero. And then if you just suppose again that you sample the same i twice just to see what happens in two iterates, you then take, you go up to a new point, take a linearization, follow it to zero and so on. So this, is, this, this illustration is just for interpolation. Just to add more confusion to the, distinguish, the distinction between two FI stars. Okay, but let's move on. Uh, you may not know what FI star is. What do you do if you don't know FI star? So, for a large part of the talk, until the very end of the of my of the very end, I'm going to relax our assumptions of what we know about the function little by little until we know basically nothing. I mean, aside from perhaps smoothness or some some form of complexity. So now let's assume this. Let's assume we know the minimum function value of the whole sum of terms, just the average. I'm going to call it tau, and I refer to it as a target. So we have a target for how small we want our total loss to be. This assumption is a little bit more relaxed than the previous one. 
I can even cook up some situations where you might know what this is. That I, some new situations that that don't that were not included in the previous one. There can be situations if you're thinking of, you know, sort of um, zero one losses, and you know you want 98 percent accuracy in your training problem. Then you could actually cook up a number for tau. You would know what it would be, or something of the sort. So this is my first relaxation. Let's just say we know this tau. What now? Well, we could naively try to solve the following nonlinear equation. Let's just try and find w such as the average of fi is equals tau. Why not? But that is not going to work. It's not going to work because anything, any way you try to touch this equation, you're going to touch all the data points. You're going to need to know something about all the fi's. So I'm not, we can't do that. So it breaks one of my things I wanted. I wanted an incremental method. So we're going to massage this and rewrite it a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce auxiliary variables, and I'm going to call them alpha i. And uh, it's very simple. I want f i w to equal alpha i. But I want the average of alpha i to equal my target, tau. So you quite, you quite quickly realize that this is just equivalent to the previous nonlinear equation in the sense that any solution of w in this equation is a solution w to the average of fi is equals tau. But I had to lift the space. So I had to add on n, I had to add on n real variables alpha. So I'm using alpha in Rn. But now, what happens if we apply a subsample newton rapson method to this? What does the method look like? So I debated long and hard if I should show you right now what is subsample newton rapson method, or this apply, what does it look like if I apply it to this? But i taken a slightly different step route. I'm going to instead talk just about subsample newton rapson in general to show you how much we know about it, uh, how efficient it is, and how we know when it converges and works. And then I'm going to get back to the end of the talk and show you what does Polyak step sizes look like if you don't know alpha fi star. So now begins the part like a technical detour in just solving nonlinear equations with subsample newton rapson This is the part where I think I told someone I'm, I'm going to use a cannon to blow up a tiny little box, in a sense. So let's talk about nonlinear equations. Uh, we'll eventually get back to stochastic optimization. Let's say now. You have an operator, capital F, maps from D dimensions to M dimensions, uh, and you want to find a root. You want to find F of W equals 0. You want to solve that. OK? Classic method for solving it is, in fact, a newton rapson Newton You linearize your operator around a current iterate. The um, Jacobian here, this D of F, is actually a row concatenation of the gradients of each fi here. And typically, to define newton rapson you'd have to say that this Jacobian is um, either full rank or invertible, so you can define new iterate. But it sucks because it's expensive. Uh, it get, the, the costs explode when D and M are large, so we're not going to do that. So what you saw me do before was I, was, I subsampled, right? I said I'm not going to touch all of the equations at once. I'm just going to pick a random equation. So what I'm doing here is I'm choosing a random unit coordinate vector and multiplying it on the left. And that's just that's a way of subsampling, right? I'm just like picking one row. And another way of writing it is this here. It's the linearization of each of capital Fi. But um, I don't want to be able to just do subsampling one row. I want to be able to do mini batching. I want to do any form of sampling that you can imagine. You know, anything, any random transformation of these linear equations. So, if anyone, if you know anything about me, ah, yes, um, before that, uh, of course, to define the method, you still need the projection step. So, before I move on to the next slide. So, again, I'm going to project my previous best guess, WT, onto the solution space of this. Otherwise, it doesn't define a method because there's no unique solution. OK. But now I want to go further. I don't want to just subsample. I want to use any form of random transformation. So if, any, if you know anything about me, I'm going to introduce sketching. And what is sketching? So I'm going to use S. Think of S as a thin 
random matrix. It has the same number of rows as the system we're trying to solve, but it has very few columns, which I'm going to use B to know the number of columns, very few, 5, 10, very small. And because I'm transposing this thin, thin matrix and multiplying it with equations, I'm like compressing all the, all the rows to just B rows. So I, I do this kind of notation, this random matrix, just to hide any form of mini batching, any form of sampling, because it, the notation is a little bit cleaner. It's more general as well anyway, uh, even though I never need this generality in its fullest, to be honest. I, I don't really ever use it in its fullest. So now the method is again the same. Uh, if I've compressed the number of rows, it's very unlikely I have a unique solution. So I'm going to project. I'm going to project my previous iterator wt onto the solution space of this. I'm going to pick up just one solution that way, which I call wt plus one. This is already online. This is a paper, a very long paper I have with my student Ray Yuan, Alessandro Lazaric, and it's already on archive. About just this, about solving. It's about solving nonlinear equations. And uh, the cool thing about this method, and why I'm going to leverage it to design stochastic methods, is that it has an efficient closed form update. It's very cheap to, to update. It's very surprising. You'll see soon that this, you would not suspect it, but this is, in fact, a form of SGD itself. It doesn't look like it, but I'm going to show you that this can be seen as SGD. That's going to be a, a little bit of a leap of faith. After which, I'm going to give you a really simple global convergence theory based on the fact that it's SGD. This global convergence theory is so tight that we've actually improved upon the classic theory, global convergence theory of newton rapson sort of ancient theory that's been well established. Just by viewing this as SGD, we can improve upon that. And then I'm going to get back to stochastic organization. So it's quite a detour. So here we go. First, it has a closed form update. Uh, this closed form update has this strange little matrix here, which is the Jacobian times Jacobian transpose, and on either side it's sketched. So it's like being compressed in rows and columns. And then I need the pseudo inverse of this small matrix, this small B by B matrix. This is why the method is not expensive, because I only need to calculate a very small pseudo inverse. Uh, yada, 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 the method is cheap because of that. I'm not going to do the complexity exactly, but it depends cubically on B and some other stuff. So next actual question, you know, does this work? Does it converge? So here we go. We're now going to take, this is a really, this is the technical core of the talk. And it's really, there's just too many details and too many symbols, I think. I, I know. So I'm apologizing already. But um, let's do it like that anyway. So I promised you that actually that method is SGD. And you wouldn't recognize it, but I'm going to force you to see it now. So consider our original problem, which is solving nonlinear equations f of w equals 0. This is the problem we had before. I'm going to transform the problem into optimization. How do you transform nonlinear equations to optimization? Nonlinear least squares. So I'm going to minimize capital F in a norm squared, but a really weird norm, super weird. I'm actually going to define a norm based on a random matrix h of s. This, this random matrix h of s is so strange. First, it, it's evaluated on some, some reference point, wt. What this random matrix looks like is this. It has all the sketching matrices. So it has a sketching matrix standing up straight, the small compressed matrix here with the two Jacobians, with the pseudo inverse, and then the sketching matrix lying down on the far right. So this is a big matrix, actually. Not that it matters, actually, but uh, this is the matrix. And I'm going to define a norm based on the expectation of this random matrix. And, and this, this curve ED, I don't think I presented it. This curve ED is the distribution from which we draw the random matrix S, the sketching matrices. So I have a stochastic optimization problem. Let me, re let me rewrite it just a little bit more. Very awkwardly, I have to fix a reference point, w WT. And uh, I wish I had more clicks here. But the first thing you need to know is that these two problems are equivalent. These first two up here, the solving nonlinear equations and this nonlinear least squares, under a very minor technical assumption. So if you squint hard and you think about it, if this expected matrix here was positive, definite, and symmetric, it defines a norm so they're clearly equivalent. 
if it defined a norm. It turned out it turns out that you don't need it to be positive definite. You only need it to be um, you only need it to be positive definite in the space where you're concerned about the solution. So there's a very small technical assumption that guarantees these two problems are invert are equivalent. And every time I apply this method and this setup to different uh, problem instantiations, this technical assumption is like ridiculously easily true. Okay. So here we have it. I want to minimize in norm squared capital F of W under a weird norm. And now I'm just going to rearrange it to bring this expectation outside the norm. And I can do that because of the way that the norm is, this induced norm is defined. It has just one, this matrix H of S just appears once on one side of the inner product. So it's, it's linear in the norm, in the matrix. So I'm going to bring the expectation outside and I'm going to rename that function inside to F S of T evaluated W. So what that is, is F S of T W is exactly our capital F function in norm squared under a pseudo norm defined by HS. Okay, so this is um, it's a little bit tough, but um, what happens now is we have a stochastic optimization problem to solve. And I only know when I have a really tough stochastic problem where I can draw samples from anything, any sort of continuous distribution, whatever, I only know SGD really, I can just use SGD. So I'm gonna solve this stochastic optimization problem with SGD. Any questions? There's a question on the chat. Uh, yes. Tim, you can ask your question. No, you don't have to have that the image space is larger. So it's, Tim, um, Tim's yeah. question was, this image space of F is assumed to have much larger dimension than D? No, guess, you don't yeah. actually need it. It's effective dimension in a sense, yes, but in actual numbers, M and D, not, not really. I think we have a hand raised also by Sharon. Sharon. You're welcome to ask your question. Hey, Sharon. So, hey. Um, so what is this index T? Yeah, good. I, I'm glad you asked. This is the, for now, it's just some arbitrary fixed WT. But it's actually going to be an iterative method, an, an iterative procedure, uh, where WT will be our current iterate. But for now, it doesn't matter, because under my technical assumption, Whatever point I put here, these problems are equivalent. And I've just chosen to put WT. Right, this so it's going to be like some inner outer loop type thing where the outer loop you increment T and in the inner loop you do SGD? You would think so, and I completely understand why you say that, but it actually just doesn't happen to be an inner, okay. inner outer okay. loop thing. But yeah, um, yeah. It, may be, it might be clearer, in the next slide, or it might be even less clear in the next slide. Um, let's have a look. So this is very, I have to admit, this is very strange, right? That you have an equivalent problem that depends on T, but it's equivalent for every T. This is something that's very hard for even us, the, the authors who wrote in the grass, but everything follows through. You see that in terms of at least the mathematics, everything follows through, but uh, for every T, these two problems are equivalent, or for every WT as you wish. OK, so I'm going to apply SGD to solve that problem, uh, this strange stochastic optimization problem that depends on a T and a W. So uh, it's stochastic again. Th this expectation is taken with respect to the sketching matrix S. So I'm going to sample IID from the sketching distribution. So what that looks like is this. I'm going to update my iterates WT, WT plus 1 to, to WT, and I'm going to sample a single sketching matrix S. And I evaluate, by coincidence, my function on WT, the same WT that defines the norm, as awkward as it may be. If you think about the definition of what is f of s t, and you take a gradient in W, remembering the WT is fixed, you actually get this. You get the Jacobian times the HS matrix times capital F. And then if you recall, what is the H of S matrix? This is the strange thing here, it's a random matrix. Plug it in, you get exactly the update of what I called before the sketched newton rapson method. So this may feel artificial, the way that I've forced this to look like SGD and the fact that my equivalent optimization problem depends on T, 
but it makes the mathematics and the proof incredibly simple. It is almost miraculous, as you'll see next. Questions? Rob? Yes. There's absolutely no requirement that the two t's are the same, right? That the t new norm and the t of the current iterate, they don't need to be the same. You can linear, linearize your norm anywhere. Yes. And it's, it's true. There might be other linearization point that leads to yes. either better behavior. Okay. You could. And it would be a well-defined method, and it would make sense. You're trying to solve a stochastic normalization problem with SGD. No one asked you that those points be the same. But in the very next slide, it turns out that if you do match these two points, if your current iterate matches the one that defines the, the iterate that's used to define the norm, you have these most amazing properties. It looks like they fall from the sky and make the proof trivial. OK, so before let's... we see this uh, mana from uh, the heavens, let's uh... Let's let Simon ask his question in the, in this slide. Yeah, so I'm, I'm getting a bit confused because um, <clears throat> here um, your objective depends on W T, even though the W star is the same. So you have a moving objective, and if you say you're running S G D with this kind of update, you, in some sense you're running S G D on objective which changes. Yes, and the. Standard the tech no, actually, I, I that's why I actually I, I put in the word online sometimes, yeah. feeling that this might save me, save my soul from saying it's just HD. I don't know if it's helping, um, but the one maybe one thing that might help is that because of that minor technical assumption, all of these problems have the same solution, even though they're different functions, but they have the same solution. So it's kind of a weird yeah, online issue. But it, for me, it's not sufficient. Like it's not because they have the same solution that you will get the right behavior by optimizing different objective. Because it could be that the dynamics of the algorithm just push you in the wrong direction. Absolutely, it could be totally crazy if it was just that. But this is there's more structure going on than than just that. It's not just any changing function. It's a changing function that has everything to do with um, the SGD update. So let me try and convince you of that by its, by its beautiful properties. So first, I've sort of convinced you that stochastic sketch newton rapson is some weird online HGD. It's, it's admittedly weird. But it turns out that the weirdness, the weird part, does not stop the standard SGD proof from following through at all. It just happens to still follow through, as we'll see. The first thing is that from the SGD literature, from the using sort of SGD language, this optimization problem is interpolated. It's overparameterized. And that's because, because F capital F of W star equals zero, the nonlinear least squares problem is also zero evaluated at W star. So we know it has a minimum that sets it to zero. And moreover, the stochastic gradients are all zero at W star. So it has like this very much like interpolated behavior. Is there a question about that, I think? I think there was a question that was later uh, rescinded. I think you answered it probably. OK, good. OK, so this miraculous proof property number one. It, for an SGD method, it, it, it's, uh, it's like trying to analyze SGD for an interpolated problem. Miraculous property number two, and these are totally gratuitous properties. I'm not making any more assumptions than the initial technical assumption I made, which I probably didn't spend enough time on for anyone to absorb. That might have been subconsciously on purpose. So uh, the next amazing property is that it has a kind of smoothness. So I, I'm calling this smoothness, and I'm going to ex explain a little bit why I call it smoothness. But the gradient, the stochastic gradient squared divided by two equal the stochastic functions. This is because I'm matching the WTs to the iterates of the algorithm. So I'm, so I'm matching the T defining the norm to the iterates of the algorithm. When you match them, you have this amazing property. I, I regret calling this smoothness, and I keep doing it now in my papers, and I'm, I'm probably confusing everyone. But I called it smoothness originally because actually it's, it's related to a consequence of a function being smooth and convex. If you have a smooth convex function, you have these kind of inequalities where the gradient at w minus gradient w star norm squared is less or equal than 2L times suboptimality. 
Um, but that doesn't mean it's smoothness. But unfortunately, I've started calling this smoothness, and I, I don't know what to do now. Maybe co-coercivity or something. It's it's nothing. It's not it's not an assumption that exists. But this one is for free. So this equality is for free. So because of this, the an SGD style analysis seems to fall from the skies. It's almost for free, almost. But it can't be totally for free, right? There is some. There is still a catch. And the catch is I need some style, some weak version of convexity. And that weak version of convexity is me and uh, Nico Loizo's favorite recent assumption, which, which is star convexity. So I'm going to assume now that, that uh, the total objective function I'm minimizing, which is the expectation of this non-linearly squared problem, defined on a norm at t, so I'm going to call it f t of w, I would need this function, f t of w, to be with star convex around w t. And what that means is exactly this here, that f t uh, evaluated at w star, where w star is any uh, variable that sets the function, the capital f to 0. I should have qual qualified that. It needs to be greater or equal than its linearization around w t. So star convex functions actually include some pretty nasty looking non-convex functions. And I've plotted the, like a surface plot of one of them here. You can barely see it, I think. But this is actually a star convex function. And some, some recent famous examples of star convex functions include several deep, deep nets along the path of SGD. So this is, this is a complicated statement. But if you were to look at the iterates of SGD, a recent paper is arguing that at all these iterates, deep nets are star convex. There's a question. Yes. Go ahead, Sharan. Um, so before we, before we go to star convexity, so yeah. in the previous slide, uh, it seems like uh, when you defined how you are doing this, it's like we are in the online setting, and we are getting these functions. And uh, every time we do online gradient descent, right? Because the t's match. Yes. You can just consider that these functions are given to you by some adversary, and then you are just doing online gradient descent. Okay. So in online gradient descent, if you want to converge, we need the step size to decrease. Right. You need to decrease at like square root t. But yeah. uh, now that you have interpolation, so I can't Constant. reconcile the two things because for interpolation you can get away with like a constant step size. So there is like yeah. something, some hidden assumption that I'm not understanding. Uh, it's uh, it's almost like uh, it's an assumption or structure. The thing is that this is just not a general online problem at all, not at all. The, the the kind of online problem, the way that it's changing, it's changing in a beautifully smooth way that's highly related to the method itself. I mean, uh, so there's there's a lot of structure that just doesn't exist in standard online. So I wouldn't know what to say about an adversarial setting where you have interpolation. Uh, you have to assume something about how the functions are, are changing in the, your online right. functions. So, so in this, the fact that you update, um, OK, so because the update from WT to WT plus 1 is bounded, and because you define FT and FT plus 1 as just the, the only thing that changes is the norm in which you measure this thing. Yes. Like your, so yep. that's why you're saying that there is um, that is the additional structure which says that the functions are changing smoothly and that allows you to use a constant step size and get away with it. Yeah, or at the very, yes, pretty much. Maybe to say in other ways that this is just completely not adversary at all. It's changing in a very clear structure. Yeah, way. I mean, yeah. even if it is stochastic, you still need to decrease the step size, right? Like if yeah. it's SGD, you still need to decrease the step size. So there is like something even more. Uh, yeah. So here you'll see that actually step size one works. This is not even, it's not even that it requires a decreasing step size, it requires step size equals exactly one because it's, uh, it, it corrects, it's, it, it's scale invariant as well. So it's not even, you know, it's, it's even more structured than that. Mm, that I find hard to believe because um, like with a step size one, you can diverge even for like simple Newton if you are like far away from the solution, right? Yes, yes, yes. And that's that the fix for that is this assumption. This ah, assumption okay. is not so weak. Okay. This also okay. fixes Newton, makes Newton converge with step size one globally. Okay. Which is actually uh, the um, one of the novelties for which we we brought to classic literature on Newton methods. 
So if I assume now the FT of W is star convex, this actually, this is the assumption I really need to make. I'm just like, well, you see this crazy function here? I don't know what, you know, strange thing. I need to assume it's star convex. And uh, you'll see, I'll give some examples of when this holds later on. But it's, a, it's an assumption. So uh, yeah, deep nets are star convex on the path of SGD. Some uh, learning, some control problems when you're trying to learn the underlying dynamics of a linear control problem, that problem is star convex. Actually, it's a, it's a quasar convex. It's a slightly relaxed version of this, but um, it doesn't make a difference. It's basically the same thing. And also, there are some non-convex generalized linear models that are star convex. Those kind of non-linear, those kind of generalized linear models, we have a loss function that kind of inverts, has like, it's more than sharp, more than just like L1, it's like super sharp, trying to enforce super sparsity. They're also star convex. So it's a nice class of functions. I kind of like exploring this new, new class. Okay. So, um, so surprisingly, if I just assume that these ft functions, ft of w, is star convex along wt, so basically just that these inequalities hold. And the one technical assumption which I showed ages ago, which can be satisfied, maybe I should give it a name. Think of it as full rank Jacobian, basically. Full rank Jacobian would be enough for most cases. Then I have the following kind of convergence, which is a bit different. I know that the minimum, the best iterate I've seen over the last t steps, so best is in the minimum of little t between capital T and one, of the expected, of the total objective function minimizing, so expectation of f of t. And this expectation is with respect to all the randomness now. I have that this is less or equal than yada, 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 one over capital T times the initial distance. So it's a kind of a sublinear kind of convergence if you were able to record what was your previous best iterate. And because I don't have convexity, I can't use Jensen's inequality. It's not proper convexity, just star convexity. And so I can't bring this average inside. When I, when we, this theory is actually surprisingly tight when we, when we translate it back to classic Newton methods, because actually this includes the full classic newton rapson method we end up getting stronger, we get faster convergence rates under strictly less assumptions than what is classically used. Because the classic proof technique does not use this angle at all. I mean, it's just completely, on face value, it's completely different. Although now we know they're related by, by really pulling apart classic theory. Question? Yeah, can you just explain what you mean by classic theory? I mean, classic theory says that like locally you would Converge. Yes, yes. Quadratically, even like, I mean, under yeah. sufficient assumption, and that's, I mean, that, that's not even a linear rate. So yes, I, yes, I, I can qualify. Uh, classic global convergence theory with of a Newton or a newton rapson method without globalization strategies. So if you don't have line search, you don't have trust region, and you don't have interior any, any kind of continuation scheme. When does a newton rapson method converge globally? It's called the monotone convergence theorem. It converges globally, uh, sublinearly, only under extremely strong assumptions, for which there is essentially only one example that satisfies all the assumptions. Right. So it's more, I should say, to be completely honest, it's, it's, comparing, it's comparing like with like. What does our global convergence theory say? If you are thinking of exactly the same, if you're thinking of the exact same newton rapson method with constant step size, or, or step size equals one. Yeah. Uh, so this proof technique. There's a question by Simon, sorry. Yeah. Rob. Okay. So, because, so you said uh, also stronger convergence, I mean, faster rates, because so here you say weaker assumption, you also get convergence, but uh, did you also get faster or it's both one over T? Uh, actually, we also got faster rates. They, they only realized, they only thought it was asymptotically one over T. I see. Instead of actually being just one over T. Okay. And then the other thing is what about the stochastic uh, newton Rapson? What was the classic or what no, was the... There, there, there is no classic, there's no, there's no such, I mean, I don't think this existed before, like this sort of sketch Newton-Rapson or stochastic Newton-Rapson. This, this version of, 
of randomized Newton Rapson is not a thing, as far as I'm aware. So there's no one to compare with. I don't know. I mean, online Newton, where you just sample one of the function, that seems that's been proposed a few years ago, right? Oh yes, but uh, this doesn't include uh, it. Doesn't include that straightforward method where you just apply Newton by subsampling one function as a special case. It includes some other things. Actually, we have a we have a collection of which kind of stochastic Newton methods does this include as a special case, and it only includes two that are recent literature methods. One's called the stochastic Newton method by Konstantin Richterich and others, and it's like a variance reduced stochastic Newton method, and that's a special case of this. Uh, they and they they didn't have global theory, so we gave them some global theory. And another method which I came up a year earlier called the subsample subspace Newton method, which sounds similar, but it's actually a special case of this as well. So um, that the only methods we found that are special cases of this and uh, poly and the poly exercise method. You'll see now what this series says. Interesting. Yeah. Sharan has a question also. Since we're okay. we stopped. Ahead, um, so if we put in strong convexity, will it improve the rate? Yeah, it's linear. You need star, you need quasar strong convexity. So you imagine star convexity where one of the variables is fixed to W star. I call that quasi, sorry, quasi star strong convexity, and then it gives you linear convergence. And will the linear convergence have a kappa or a kappa square? Uh, kappa. Uh, the L here is one, so it's just got the mu. So you have to assume that this thing is quasi strongly convex with constant mu, and you get a linear convergence that is one minus mu. Oh. And you can also you can also see that mu is is required to be less than one always between one and zero. It's impossible that it's anything else. I see. Anyone else? This proof technique for SGD, I actually uh, stole it from one my paper with uh, Nicola Loizu and Othman Cebu, this kind of proof technique that um, you just assume star convexity of SGD and see what you can do. OK, so now we're going to go back to optimization. Um, first thing is, what does all that say about just the stochastic polyac method? Just to warm up again, I'm going to almost repeat what I just said, but specialize just for that, that stochastic polyac step size method I introduced earlier. The first thing it says is that actually stochastic polyac is in fact an online SGD method. As strange as it may seem. You can, so if you stare at this for a while, and I think this is true both for both versions of what we call stochastic polyac, for both of them that you can see that minimizing this function is equivalent to, in fact, minimizing this function. I, I have to add a caveat that there's, I'm dividing here by the stochastic gradient evaluated at a reference point, WT, and norm squared. I, I, I actually want to write pseudo inverse instead of divided. And the, the subtle difference is pseudo inverse, if you divide by zero, it, it gives you zero. It's well-defined. Well, you know, one over zero is not well-defined normally. So these two problems are clearly equivalent if you stare at them long enough in both of our senses, at least, of what is Fi star. And so why not just apply SGD to this problem and see what you get? I need to give it a name. I'm going to call these functions Fi of t. You can just fix this notation for one minute and it'll be gone. So you need to raise it from memory soon. So for now, I'm just going to say that they're non-zero. But in reality, it's a pseudo inverse. They could be zero. So what is an online SGT step look like? I'm going to just take a step size, a step, uh, I'm going to step in the direction of the negative stochastic gradient. And it turns out that stochastic gradient is, of course, the SPS method. And I, you know, by design, really. And what this says is that actually that, m I, I called it the master theorem. Did I say that? That big theorem about the convergence of uh, sketch newton rapson it means that I just apply that master theorem and I get a gratuitous analysis of stochastic polyac step sizes. And uh, this gratuitous analysis actually says this. If I specialize that master theory as a corollary, this is what I get. If the iterates WT come from that method I call SPS, if the individual, do I need the FI function to be star convex? I think this might be 
I think I only need them to be star convex in expectation, actually. Yes. Anyway, let's just say star convex to the individual loss functions. And I also need to assume a smoothness. And this is a corollary of the master theorem. Now, this is a confusing part. It turns out that these two conditions together actually mean that the auxiliary function from the master, master theorem is star convex. So as weird as it may seem, I actually need both of these assumptions now. And as a result, I get this following convergence for SPS, for the stochastic polyx step size, as, as a special case of that master theorem. Now, this entire result is not new. It's, I think, line word for word equal to the theorem me and Nico recently presented, in, which is actually going to appear in ASTATS. But it's interesting that it's a special case of the master theorem. So Rob, I mean, either you cannot run this method or you're assuming interpolation. So which one is it? Um, so if, you, if fi star is your fi star, you cannot run it because you don't know fi of w star. But if you are assuming interpolation, then you can run it. And then this gives the, the same rate that we had. So yes, I don't know. I don't know a reasonable situation where I would know it aside from interpolation. And yes, it would match. In that case, it would match the one from your paper because of interpolation, yes. So I don't know actually where this would be known otherwise. Okay. And that's why we move on to the next slide where we don't know it anymore because I just don't know when I would know that thing. So now let's go back to that other assumption and that other setup I had before. So I'm gonna forget that we know F5 W star. Now we just know tau, which equals F of W star. So the, it's actually the minimum of the total loss function. This is also not that easy to know. And in the last slide, I'm going to get rid of this assumption as well. We're not going to need to know, surprisingly, anything. Well, you know, there will be assumptions as always. So now I'm going to attack these following nonlinear equations I presented earlier, where I had these auxiliary variables alpha i, and, e, and each fi of w equals alpha i, and the, the average of the alpha i is equals the target tau. What, does, what happens now if I apply a subsample newton Rapson method? So uh, first things, let's break this up. This has n plus one equations. There's one top equation, and then there are n other equations below. So the n plus one equations. If I sample one of the bottom equations, so I'm going to sample uniformly at random one of the rows and apply newton Rapson. So let's, let's say I just sampled one of these guys in the box. I'm going to linearize just like before, but now on the right-hand side, it's alpha. And then I'm going to get my previous iterates and project them onto the solution space. But be wary, because W are iterates, and so are the alphas. They are also variables. Now, what happens instead if I sample the first row? Well, same thing. I don't need to linearize, because it's already linear. You can't linearize linear. Well, it doesn't go anywhere. And, I'm, and because there's no W, I'm not going to bother projecting in W, because that will give me no way. Uh, I won't change my W. So I'm just going to project my previous alpha T onto the solution space. Now, what do you guys, what do you guys think this looks like, this method? I'm going to give you now the closed form. This is not a closed form formula, right? This is just an interpretation. It's this really funky moving a targeted polyac step size method. And it looks like this as a closed form update. In W, it performs kind of like the SPS update, but it has an alpha IT instead of alpha FI star or whatever. And the alpha I's, the uh, T's, they, the alpha I's update as well. They also adjust what is their belief of what is FI star in a sense. They're constantly adjusting what they think it is. This method is incremental. At this point, it only requires a single data point to make it to advance. Every so often, when you sample the top row, you have to update all the alphas according to your target tau. And I'm going to use a little condensed notation here, uh, which I want you to memorize. This one you actually you have to memorize. Alpha bar is the average of alpha i's. So if I sample the top row and I apply newton rapson I get this kind of update, an, an update where the different alpha i's communicate to each other what they think is you know, the individual targets. And this is why I call it the targeted polyac method. 
Now, the amazing thing is, because I've shown that this is a subsample newton rapson method, I know exactly everything about it in convergence, the, the theory, what, what I need to guarantee to get sublinear, even linear rates. So everything, all the work is actually done. I'm going to walk you through it just to see the, the magic, but it's done. Questions? So before the magic commences, let's let Nicolas ask his, his question. So, hello. So, I have a question about the AI. Do you know if the limit of the AIs goes to the FI star? So, if you take the AI, AI T and yeah. you run it through to infinity, yes, they, that they means that they approximate the FI star with a magical way. So, yes. you do that adaptively. Yep, yeah, they have to. They have to converge to FI star because okay. they solve because they solve this. Uh, these equations, and because of my assumption is that the average must equal tau only at the optimum, or at any optimum, the average of any fi is w if equals tau, then it's the w is optimum. So yeah, the fi is converge. Okay, and the fi star in all of this is the uh, optimum value of the f evaluated w star. It's the same thing, correct? We still have this definition. Yeah, let me let's stare at this one second, and let me just double confirm that. So the average of the FIs equals tau. Yes, it's still the original one I gave before. It's still saying that alpha i is converged to FI at W star, where W star is the solution to the overall problem. Right? I think that's that is correct. It's not so as again uh, this distinction from what from what you guys had before. Okay, that's cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let the magic commence. Let's have a look. What's next? Uh, first, I've just put up the pseudo code because you know who doesn't like a bit of code? It's basically exactly what I just told you guys. It just has a cool title. I call it TASPs, Targeted Stochastic Polyac Step Size Method. I think I'll stick with that name. Um, I haven't tested it yet. I haven't even run it once. But I can prove it converges. That's what you get for work. And probably I'll put this, I'll put all this online in one month. And even by then, I probably won't have run many numerics. Only after will I run extensive numerics and then submit somewhere. It's probably a weird pattern of doing things, but okay. So as I said, I'm just gonna repeat the magic that I've already shown you, but I, I really want to like sort of drive this in. The first thing is that the target poly step size is of course an online SGD method because all subsampled or sketch and absent methods are this strange online SGD. And what does it look like in this case? It looks like this. And if you stare at this, so that the it's equivalent to minimize the average of FIs as it is to minimize this function in W and alpha, and then the W that solves this should give you the original problem. And if you stare at this, you realize that it must be true because you know that tau is the minimum value you can obtain in the objective function. It's quite easy for you to sit down uh, you know, write out the, the the stationarity conditions, and and you or and you also realize that this thing has a minimum, which is zero. So it has it. You can attain its minimum. So it's, you can stand alone, stare at these two, and you'll realize after a while that the same. Uh, a distinction here is that I'm going to apply when I apply H G D to solve this problem. I perceive this as a sum of n plus one terms, because there are n terms here, and there's another one here. So when I apply SGD, I'm gonna uniformly sample any one of these terms between one and n plus one. So if I sample i between one and n plus one, if i is not the n plus one term, so I mean, if it's any one of the terms that are in the box, then you can see the SGD will give you exactly the update of the task method in both W and alpha. Maybe I'll just skip over the details. I think it's probably, it's getting late. It's quite long. So SGD again, the same thing. Um, and you recover the task method. And other details, if I, I said that I is different than N plus one, but if I equals N plus one and you apply SGD to this one term over here, you get this very simple update that says WT plus one equals WT, nothing changes, but the alphas, they, they, they readjust. Okay, so again, I just sort of repeating the same thing. 
again, I can apply master, the master theorem and I get gratuitous, I think probably spelled correctly, gratuitous analysis. I'm not gonna show the analysis, I'm just gonna, you're just gonna believe me so that we wind down. And now for the grand finale, uh, what happens if you don't even know the target? You don't even know tau. What can you do? You can still come up with an equivalent optimization problem. You actually make tau into a variable. You ask for the smallest tau squared possible. If you backwards engineer this, you realize that this problem is in fact equivalent to the original problem always, amazingly as it may seem. And you can just apply SGD to solve this and you get a version of the TASPS algorithm that doesn't require that you know tau. It also adjusts its belief of what is tau. There's a so question. That. Yes. Tim, go ahead, please. Tim. Tim, you're muted. OK, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to clarify some uh, terminology. When you say two problems are equivalent, are you saying that the set of global minimizers is the same and or the set of local min local minimizers is set, the same? Set of global minimizers. There is missing one assumption that this has this function has to be lower bounded. And I actually think it needs to be differentiable to be the same. So a lower bounded function um differentiable the set of minimizers are the same notice that this is a function a problem in w alpha and tau so uh, you need to get just the w's you yeah, sure sure yeah okay thanks so this is now cool but now i have a sad news which i just i i'm doing this work this part right now the sad news is that this is not a subsample newton rapson method i use the same sgd trick but it is no longer a subsample newton rapson method. The theory and convergence of this is no longer gratuitous. I can prove it using standard SGD theory. I can work on it individually, you know, from scratch, but it is not, it doesn't fit the framework of everyone else. Question Jack? by Karan. So does this interpolation type thing fail for as soon as you add, like you don't know tau? Yes, exactly. Not knowing tau, that kind of free interpolation that I had of the stochastic gradients is gone. Right, yeah, okay, yeah. And are uh, you assuming, yeah. uh, like, I don't know, somewhere that things are non-negative, like alpha i is non-negative? No, somewhere, uh, no, not here. Okay. Okay, uh, that's the end of my talk. This is uh, the part that I least know about because I wrote it down a week ago. So, um, you know, if you poke me hard enough, you'll find that something's wrong, probably. Um, but I have pseudocode of it, and I even highlighted how you update tau. But, you know, who's going to stare at pseudocode now? It's too much code. So that's the end of the talk. I talked about designing new incremental methods using stochastic uh, sketch Newton method. I showed you what's that? Yes, I, I can exploit new kinds of assumptions in the functions, you know, knowing the global uh, minimum, so the, the, minim, this, the minimum of the function, for instance. I don't think it's not a typical sort of assumption, and it's also a weird one anyway. And I also shown you how you can use SGD interpretations to get like a fast convergence in comparison to sort of standard theory of the same setting. And it does hold for some non-convex functions. Keep your eyes open, because I'll have a paper online in probably just over a month with at least this you've seen so far, and this is joint work with Aaron DeFazio and Microbat. That's it. Thank you, Rob.